Sometimes life is full of cliches. Yes, cliches are there for a reason because they're common occurrences or sayings. Well, my life lately had become a cliche when it came to my wife of 10 years. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Martin Baxter and I run my own salsa business here in Santa Barbara, California. I have every type of Mexican, Central, and South American peppers known to man at my disposal. I've even recently started making habanero salsa. People love it in very small doses. It's also very popular at colleges as part of hazing, it seems. Some of my best customers for the really hot stuff are fraternities. Go figure. I've always loved spicy food, so it was natural that I go into the business. As for how my wife fits into some of the cliches in life, Cindy has been getting distant of late. Yes, I know now. I know anyway. That's another cliche. When we got married ten years ago, we were both madly in love with each other. I'd just gotten out of the army and was setting up my first salsa shop. I'd saved quite a bit of my money and taken some culinary courses online while I was in. Hey, it kept me sane in Afghanistan for that first year. Then I was out and ready to do some business. Getting the loan was easy back then, before the economic downturn caused by the housing bubble bursting all over the place. But even today, my salsa business, Baxter Burner, is still going strong. The problem, however, isn't with my business, as you could probably guess by now. No, the problem was my wife and the fact that she was cheating on me. How I found out was the big cliche. Well, not quite. The big cliche is coming home early and catching them in bed together. No, the second big cliche is leaving, forgetting something then coming back in and overhearing the conversation about them getting together while I was busy at work and our son was in school. Yes, we have a kid together, Brian Baxter, named after Cindy's dad. Oh, and before you ask, yes, he's mine. I know he's mine since he was conceived on our honeymoon and we were together every moment of every day alone on her dad's yacht. Also, I had a DNA test done on him after I found out about her affair. How it all came about was yet another cliche. I'd forgotten my laptop that had my finished formula on it for the new Scorch Salsa. Yeah, I know, not too original. But the fact that it was as pure habanero as you could get in paste form was something. Of course, we'd be adding other elements to it as we went, but I was going to put the first batch together that day. I needed the laptop and went back in as quietly and quickly as I could to get it. As I walked into my den, I could hear her down the hallway as she talked on the phone. Of course, I could only hear half her conversation. Hey sexy, yes, the idiot is gone to work, she giggled. Yes, don't worry, you're going to get something today that he's never had. Mem hum, you guessed it. I want you to set me on fire with that big stick, baby. Oh yes, my world imploded. I numbly gathered my laptop and headed back out to my car. Hell, I don't even remember the drive to the shop. When I got there, Becky was behind the counter, and Suri was sitting with a customer, letting him taste test the latest batch of our medium-hot piquant salsa that put paste to shame. I managed to paste on a smile as I wondered what I was going to do. Divorce, of course. Cindy's father hadn't trusted me back when I first met and married his daughter, so I'd had to sign a prenup. The prenup stated that in case of spousal infidelity, the offending party would leave the marriage with nothing. In case of divorce, it hadn't been a one-way street, since I wouldn't have signed it if it was. Then all the Kleitsch questions popped into my head. How long has she been with him? Why was she even with him? Was I not good enough for her? Why does she disrespect me to him? If she's that unhappy, why hasn't she divorced me yet? How am I going to prove her adultery? That was when it hit me, the most evil plan that ever entered my mind. And upon reflection of what I was planning, I realized that I felt no guilt over it whatsoever. I looked at all the pluses I had going for me. Seven inches uncut and thick, and I know how to use it. I'd been around long enough to know fake from real orgasms, and Cindy hadn't faked one in the ten years we'd been married. 
I always gave her multiples, usually starting with my tongue and fingers, then even a couple with my weapon of choice. It couldn't be about the sex, could it? I'd memorized the Kama Sutra for God's sake. I was still in good shape, working out three times a week and running five days a week. Yeah, I still did my own PT regimen from when I was in. But the plan itself was, upon further reflection, possibly the most evil plan anyone had ever devised for revenge. See, the heat in chili peppers like the habanero attacks the mucous membranes in the mouth. However, have you ever eaten some very spicy food and been sat on the toilet the next day, crying, come on, ice cream, as you were taking a dump? Yes, I was getting downright sadistic as I thought about how I was going to exact my revenge. 150,000 Scoville units worth of heat in a vaginal and slash or rectal cavity was going to make for some very fun times, at least for me. Now, I just needed a delivery system. I cooked up the small batch in record time and told the girls to have a taste. They each had to fan their mouths and eat a lot of bread to get the fire put out. Both then gave enthusiastic thumbs up for my efforts. I still needed a delivery system, however. The day passed quickly, and while I always enjoyed talking to the young ladies who I employed, I took off early for home. I stopped by my lawyer's office and had him draw up divorce papers citing infidelity as the cause. I told him that I would have some evidence in a day or two. He was reluctant at first, but when I told him about the conversation that I'd heard that morning, he was sympathetic and nodded his assent. Then I left his office and drove home. As I turned onto my street, I saw a little red Mercedes sports coupe pulling out of my driveway and heading my direction. The man behind the wheel was blonde, blue-eyed, and had a self-satisfied smirk on his face, the face of the lover. I recognized him as a guy from one of Cindy's social functions that we went to. He was always asking her to dance, and she was always accepting those dances. Now I knew why. My anger grew again, and I was more than ready to put my plan into action. The hardest part was going to be acting normal when I got home. I wasn't about to tip my hand to the lover before I could play it. I took a deep breath, then went inside. I pasted on my best loving husband's smile and went inside. Hi, honey. Cindy greeted me with enthusiasm. She'd obviously just showered, as her hair was still a bit damp. Her long blonde locks fell over her shoulders, and I was once more entranced by her beauty. But physical beauty is one thing. Inner ugliness trumps that. After the conversation she'd had with her lover that morning, her outward beauty didn't have quite the hold on me that it once did. Hey, sexy lady, a shower at this time of day. I asked playfully, touching her hair. Yeah, I had quite a workout earlier, she smiled and kissed me. Yeah, I bet you did. Well, your workout tomorrow will be a lot more interesting, I thought to myself. She said that dinner would be ready in an hour, so I kissed her again and headed down the hall to our bedroom. The smell of Febreze in the room almost masked the smell of sex, but at least they changed the sheets on the bed. I almost lost my lunch when I thought of sleeping in that bed with her tonight. I'd be burning it at my earliest convenience. Then the thought hit me. They had to be using some kind of lube for anal sex. I searched her nightstand, and sure enough, there was the tube of cherry KY jelly that we sometimes used. Son of a gun. I popped the cap, and it was nearly the same shade of red as the salsa I'd created with the white-hot fire inside. I grinned as I took the cap completely off the KI, squeezed some of it into the toilet, flushed, used it, then poured some of the paste from the small bottle of salsa into the tube. I replaced the cap and squeezed it around, mixing it up inside the tube itself. Then I took the cap back off and put even more of the salsa into it, then repeated the process. Once I thought it was mixed up enough, I pulled the cap off and squeezed out a little. I sniffed it, and sure enough, it was in there good. I washed my finger off and replaced the cap again, then replaced it in her nightstand just as I found it. I was in a much better mood now and took a nice long hot shower. I then went out to eat dinner, wearing a pair of blue jeans, a t-shirt, and a smile on my face. God, 
That smells great. I enthused as I sat down at the table. I opened a bottle of beer, and we all dug into her lasagna. God, I was going to miss her cooking probably even more than I was going to miss the sex with her. Brian had gotten home and was sitting in his spot between Cindy and me. We talked about his day at school, and Cindy admonished him to get his homework done. Yes, she's a pretty good mom to him too. Cindy sexually has always been a quick study, very skilled and enthusiastic. So yes, I loved having sex with her, be it either or making love. It was always special. For a few moments, I pondered the ramifications of what I was about to do. Petty revenge on my cheating wife and her lover, then divorce that would leave her with nothing from our married life together. She could sue for custody of Brian, and she might even win. I love my son, and I really didn't want him to be subjected to her after our divorce. I was already planning for that as well. I had specified in the divorce papers that I wanted full custody of my son and that I would allow her generous visitation, but only supervised by me. I didn't want him subjected to her lover, who might just try and take my spot as Brian's father. The pain in my heart was ever-present that evening, and soon I begged off, saying I needed sleep. I told Cindy that I wasn't feeling good and that I'd tried a really hot salsa at work. She smiled sympathetically and bid me good night. I went first into my den and grabbed my old mini camcorder and mini tape recorder. I had last used the camcorder on our last anniversary vacation when we went to Disney World, and I had last used the recorder when I was first starting out to record my thoughts before I bought the laptop. I then went into our bedroom and put the camcorder behind some DVDs below our TV so that it had a good view of the bed. I made sure that the little green light was covered with electrical tape so it wouldn't give it away when I turned it on in the morning. The battery was at full charge, though, good for a full eight hours of footage as long as I started it right before I left in the morning. I hid the recorder under the bed, but didn't start recording yet. The little memory stick in the recorder would record for up to eight hours as well. The battery was also at full charge. I grinned. It was obvious they had been here all day long and had gotten done in time for them both to shower and for him to leave. If I hadn't been a bit early turning onto my street, I might never have seen him. The only possible problem with my plan was that they might not do anything the next day. Well, if not, then I'd keep on keeping on until I caught them in the act. I then used my cell to call Becky. I told her that I was going to take a few days off, but if Cindy called to tell her that I was in a meeting with a client, I then explained the situation, but only that I was trying to catch them in the act, and she said no problem. Oh, boss, Becky is good people, and she knows that I would never cheat on Cindy. She's also a knockout of Puerto Rican descent. She's been with the shop for five years and knows her stuff about running a business. Sleep that night was a long time coming. I kept thinking about what might happen in the morning or what might happen a few days from now. From the way she'd been talking to him, they'd been seeing each other for a while now. I already figured out what to do in the morning and each successive morning if it came to that. After I started the camera and recorder, I would slip out, drive around to the alley behind our house, and come through the alleyway gate and up to just below our bedroom window. I would be able to hear anything going on from that vantage point. I stuck a cooler outside with some snacks, beer, and sodas in it, one of those nice coolers that will keep things cold for days at a time as long as the battery held the charge. I finally fell asleep praying that something would happen sooner rather than later. I woke up the next morning and got dressed as usual. I waited until Cindy got in the shower, then turned the camera and recorder on, leaving the house like normal. It took no time at all to get behind the house and slip in through the alley gate. I left my car there since I would hopefully only be there for a little while. After Cindy sent Brian off to school, she was once again on the phone. Once again, she invited him over, and from her confirmation, he would be there in twenty minutes. I grinned. I had made sure that I wouldn't be spotted through the window either by them or by the camera that had an awesome view of the room. 
I drove to the nearest drugstore around the corner from our house and picked up a new tube of the heated cherry KI jelly that Cindy preferred. It was a flash of inspiration to cover my tracks just in case. I got home ten minutes later and was perched under my bedroom window in fifteen minutes with five minutes to spare. I then sat beneath the window, opened the cooler, and pulled out a ham and Swiss sandwich and an ice-cold microbrew ale. I sipped it slowly between bites of my sandwich, enjoying the rich taste, when I heard the lover's Mercedes in the driveway. Apparently, they didn't give a rat's ass if the neighbors saw it. I decided that it would be a shame if something bad were to happen to his ride. So as soon as I heard the front door open and close, I slipped around to the side of the house, then out through the side gate. I had my pocket knife on me, and I decided to carve adulterer in his doors. Oh my, my revenge might get me thrown in jail, but I was going to have a heck of a lot of fun while doing it. I tried his door handle, and lo and behold, the arrogant prick had left it unlocked. Well, we lived in a good neighborhood, and nothing bad happened during the day. I checked his glove box and found his registration and insurance cards, John Lawson. Now he had a name, but I was going to keep calling him the lover. It was easier to remember. I took his registration and insurance cards and pocketed them. I then decided that a little cut to his valve stems would be a lot of fun, so I saw it halfway through them. I heard the screams starting and called Paul, my attorney, and told him it was game on. I let him know the evidence would be there in a couple of hours tops and to get the ball rolling on a lawsuit. I told him to name Mr. John Lawson in the infidelity divorce papers. I then slipped back into the backyard and heard them through the window as they screamed in pain from the hottest salsa on earth, causing their rear ends to catch fire, figuratively speaking. I sat below the window and chugged some more of the ale. I allowed a big grin to crease my face, and I had to stifle a laugh as they tried to figure out what was going on. Oh God, why is my tool burning? He screamed. My glory hole and rear are on fire. Holy cow, it hurts she shrieked. Finally, I got up and decided to go inside. Oh darn, it seems I forgot my laptop again. I went and pulled my car back around to the driveway, then went inside and found them writhing in agony as they tried like mad to get in the shower and drenched themselves in cold water to put out the fire. When I got to the bathroom door, I summoned my anger. What the heck is going on here? I roared. The tableau was priceless. The lover's tool was large, very large, probably at least ten inches. It was also red and swollen from the salsa getting into his pee hole. He was uncut, and the salsa had gotten under his foreskin. I took some very deep satisfaction from that turn of events. I then looked at my wife, whose rear and glory hole were both crimson red from the irritation and intense burning caused by the jelly. Oh my God, Marty! She screamed, then let out a yelp of pain. Please, Marty, I'm so sorry, she yelled again. The lover was also pleading his case, begging me not to hurt him. I kept my face a studied mask of anger and disbelief. I stepped forward and landed a punch from hell on the lover's jaw, knocking him back into the wall of the shower stall. I then unleashed several brutal kicks to his balls, in effect annihilating them. At that point, I pulled out my cell phone and called 911. While he was unconscious and Cindy was crying and screaming her rear off, literally, I grabbed the doctored tube of KI and replaced it with the new tube, seal broken, and a few dabs removed from it. I then went out to my car and disposed of the doctored tube under my back seat. I'd dump it later in a dumpster behind a gas station or something. I told the 911 operator that I had returned home to get my laptop for work and had caught my wife in the shower with her lover. I told her that something seemed to be very wrong with both of them and that their privates were swollen and red. She dispatched the police and ambulance to my address. I thanked her and ended the call. Now our neighbor across the street, Mrs. Kendall, was a real busybody and local gossip queen. I knew she knew about the lover coming over for daily visits, so when the EMTs and cops arrived, I went across the street to talk to her. Oh, hi, Marty, 
she said with a smile as she opened her door. Hi, Mrs. Kendall. Have you by chance seen that little red Mercedes at my house before? I asked with a smile. Why, yes, for the last few months, in fact, every Monday through Friday, she smiled, her apparent innocence belied by the fact that she actually knew about it for that long. Thank you, Mrs. Kindle. Um, did you see anything strange this morning other than the red Mercedes pulling in? I asked. Nothing, dear, she said so she hadn't seen me defacing his car. I saw you leave, and then Brian leaves for the bus stop. Then he got there about twenty minutes after Brian left. I then went and watched my morning shows, and when I came back, you were just pulling back up to the house. Thank you, Mrs. Kindle. Do you mind if the police get a statement from you? I asked. Oh, not at all, dear. Anything I can do to help said the little old lady who knew more of other people's business than they did. Thank you so much, Mom. I smiled, gave her a hug, then returned to my side of the street and the waiting cops. I called Becky and asked if she would say that I was there in the morning but had forgotten my laptop. She asked why, and I told her the short version of what had happened. She laughed her rear off and promised to be my alibi. She said she'd get Siri in on it too. I thanked her then went and talked to the detective who had just shown up. Are you Mr. Baxter? he asked. Yes, sir. I nodded. He proceeded to question me about my whereabouts, and I told him that I had gone into work at my salsa shop, but had forgotten my laptop. When I returned, I heard the screaming and caught my wife and her lover in the shower, screaming for some unknown reason. I admitted to losing my temper and assaulting the man who was trespassing on my property, and the detective said he would worry about that later. The female EMT finally managed to get Cindy's rear and glory hole cooled down enough with some aloe cream that she would be coherent enough to question. She went and grabbed the tube of KOI from the nightstand and handed it to the detective, who bagged it as evidence. I told the detective that my wife and I used it sometimes for the extra sensations during lovemaking, which was true, or had been, so my prints on it wouldn't draw suspicion. The car was a different matter, but as Mrs. Kendall had been watching since I pulled back up in my car after defacing it, she was more than willing to sign a written statement to be my alibi. I always liked the old busybody. I swore that I didn't know who wrote those things on his doors, but promised to shake the guy's hand if I ever met him. He did me a favor. When Cindy and her lover were transported to the hospital for observation and a few tests, I went in and collected my evidence. I got the camcorder from behind the DVDs, then collected the voice recorder from under the bed. I stopped both recordings and went to my den to download the memory sticks to my laptop. I cut out the video after I walked in and caught them, so me replacing the tube of K.I. wasn't on there. I also cut the same amount of time from the voice recording. Detective Crawford came into my den as I was finishing my creative deletions. He told me that even if I defaced the man's car, he would make sure that no charges were filed. He also would say nothing in his report about the destroyed testicles. I asked why. Let's just say you aren't the only man with a cheating wife. My ex did the same to me. Score one for us cuckolded hubbies, he said. He shook my hand, and I showed him the footage I'd recorded from the bedroom. He laughed hard along with me when they started screaming in mid-action after he pulled out and then entered again. He used the doctored KI, switching from one place to another. Perfect. After we'd wiped the tears of laughter from our eyes, he told me they would tow the lover's car at the owner's expense. He shook my hand again and left, still chuckling at the Keystone Cop-style comedy of the two falling all over themselves and each other trying to get into the shower in the cold water. But at least the why part of my question had been answered. The guy had three inches on me and was a bit wider. I had never figured Cindy for a size queen, but she wanted something bigger and it had just begun to cost her. I called Paul and had him send the process servers to Santa Barbara General, where Cindy and her lover had been taken. I then emailed him the evidence of the affair and told him to get a copy of Mrs. Kindle's statement from the cops. He told me he would, and I sat back 
and waited on Brian to get home. Now, the real moral quandary. What do I say to my nine-year-old son about why his mommy is in the hospital? I sighed and came up with a plan that wouldn't vilify her too badly. I settled on telling him that mommy had a problem with wanting other men besides me. And that wasn't okay. I would drive that home in my son's head, so he wouldn't end up thinking it was okay for women to sleep around on their husbands. I then thought back to when I overheard their conversation the previous morning and started laughing again. It had just occurred to me that she had given me the idea on how to wreak my vengeance. I want you to light my rear on fire with that big stick, baby. Yes, those were her words. Well, she got her wish. It was an hour later when I got a call from the hospital on my cell. Hello, I said. Marty. That would be my loving wife, a.k.a. Cindy. She sounded angry. Oh, hi, I said. I suppose the process servers found you and your lover too, I grinned. You jerk. I don't know what you did to me, but by God, I'm going to press charges on your little rear. She screamed. What the heck are you talking about, you two-timing? I shouted back, going on the offensive. I came home to pick up my laptop and found you in the shower with some guy who had obviously been with you. I don't know what the heck you think I might have done, but I just found out about that this morning. Oh, and since when is my tool little? You just got used to Mr. Big Red there. No wonder you've been so loose lately. That's what happens to a size queen. Don't come home. Brian is going to live with me, and you won't get anything in the divorce after my evidence gets admitted in court. You're lucky I'm giving you visitation, but I will not let you get him thinking that a cheating wife is okay. That took the wind out of her sails. You, you wouldn't tell him what I did, would you? She said in a small voice. Darn right I will. Why not? He deserves to know what his mother is. I shouted at her some more. Shall I go on? How many have there been? Is Brian even my son? If not, you will tell me who the father is, and I will sue him for back child support for raising his bastard. No, Brian is our son, she said in a small voice. Well, you'll pardon me if I get a DNA test on that, I said, not bothering to hide my malice. Then she started really crying, and each sob was music to my ears. Wow. I was turning into a real bastard. But then I had cause, just cause. I was not going to be a laughingstock anymore. That honor would go to Mr. John Lawson, or was that Mr. John Nutless Wonder Lawson now? Whichever, he was still an idiot. When Brian got home, I softened a bit and only gave him the bare minimum of information that he needed. I turned it into an object lesson on infidelity, telling him that bad things happened to adulterers. Mommy would be fine eventually, but she wouldn't be living with us anymore. He hugged me and said that he loved us both, but he didn't want to live with an adulterer. I smiled in spite of myself at his mispronunciation. Well, not much else to tell except that the divorce went through without a hitch. I talked to Cindy's father about what happened and confided in him what I had done. He laughed so hard I thought the old guy was going to have a heart attack. Cindy did eventually make a full recovery, but she never ate salsa again, nor did she ever take it in the rear again, that I know of at least. John Lawson ended up having both of his ruined testicles removed. The official police report said that it had been accidental as he had slipped in the shower and racked his balls on a bar of soap. I smirked at that one. Good old Detective Crawford. Good man there. Last I heard, he had left town for parts unknown. Well, serves him right for cheating with another man's wife. When I finally got the truth from Cindy about what had happened to start the affair, she admitted that he had come onto her at one of her social events while I was out of town securing a pepper contract. She'd had too much wine, and once she felt his big tool in her, she knew she wanted it all the time. She said she still loved me and that it was only sex, and I bet you thought the cliches were over. Not a chance. She begged me to take her back. Cliche. She said that she would never stray again. Cliche. I told her to get lost. Cliche. And onward, and so forth. Becky and I have started dating, 
and she assured me that she is not a size queen, especially after the first time we were together, and she came all over my tool as I shot up inside her. We're getting married in a month, and our baby is due next spring. Brian is excited that he's getting a little brother or sister. The last time I talked to Cindy after her visitation with Brian, we got to talking. I never should have cheated on you, Marty, she said with a resigned sigh. Why not? I was an idiot, and he lit your rear on fire. I grinned, and the shock on her face made my entire day. Life is full of cliches, but sometimes life is also pretty good. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.